Hello and welcome to week eight of Pickles and Play-Doh. Tonight is, what is it, February 18, 2019. We're coming live at, at you. 9.37 p.m. from the Grism Hall basement of Florida Tech, Melbourne, Florida. Today you are here with me, Christian Dossett, uh, my friend Jace Petrowski, co-host, and uh, our esteemed guest, Paul Arbic. Hey. Uh, Paul is a fellow student here at Florida Tech. He is an undergrad on the fast track for his mathematics uh, pursuit. I could have said that a little more eloquently. But <laughs> basically, this guy's wicked smart, and uh, he's going to talk to us about how uh, math basically just is is everything and is, is far more than we think about it. It's a whole other language that this man thinks in. And um, he's making a funny face to me right now, but I, I think it's, it's important to recognize that any language that we describe the universe in, whether it be English, Pig Latin, French, Spanish, math, it's all arbitrary. And at once it didn't exist, and it's like kind of a, it's a, it's a model that we have devised to better understand the world around us. And math does a much, much more accurate job of doing that than our languages do. Definitely. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I... Yeah, and without further ado, I think we should at least uh, take a little time and a little bit about Paul before we dive into things. Um, so, Paul, let us uh, know, why did you choose to be a mathematics major? Uh, to tell you the truth, I uh, picked this degree because I didn't want to limit myself and I wanted to make money. <laughs> uh, I looked at what the best degrees were to actually get paid, and math and statistics was the third highest average paying degree that you could get behind being a petroleum engineer and a lawyer. <laughs> and they were all within only $1,000 average annual salary of each other. Uh, but then also, math as a degree is actually probably the least limiting out of all the degree programs I could have went into. Um, a lot of people don't realize what mathematicians actually do. Uh, they think that the only thing you can do is be a math teacher, which is completely false. Um, for starters, just like most engineers and science majors, I can get contracts with companies like Harris and Northrop Grumman uh, that where you know you have contracts that have to be constantly renewed and you have to work on different projects and you keep switching back and forth. Uh, I don't want to do that personally, but I mean that is an option, just as any engineer could do. But then additionally, I can also go into um, more theoretical things like even though theoretical physicists are the ones you normally think of working for like the Hadron Collider and stuff like that, they still mm -hmm. use just pure mathematicians in a lot of cases um, to do many of the things. And I could easily get a job doing highly scientific things like that. Um, as well as, uh, as well as uh, all sorts of other interesting things that really aren't connected to degree in any particular way. Uh, for example, um, on the Simpsons TV show, something like five or six of the writers are PhD mathematicians. Uh, now, of course, you, you don't want to think to yourself that you need this degree to actually be a writer for a TV show like that. Dang. But for some reason, it just happened to be that way, and it became super popular, and it's still on the air to this day, obviously. Is that how they, uh, predict, That's how they predict everything? That's how they predicted the future, right? Of We're going to put on They're our tinfoil like, hats. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they, know, they know everything was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They're just like in there with a giant math equation. They're like, all right, we're going to make this the episode. Donald Trump's going to be president <laughs> or whatever. Like. Well, they actually have made some episodes where it was all about math. There's a famous episode where somehow Bart ends up going to a math competition or a uh, science competition with uh, the rest of the school there. I don't know how he got onto the team to begin with. And he solves a complex math problem by looking at the hairs on his father's head <laughs> um, because he has to imagine how the lines would cross uh, and how many intersections there would be. Holy um, Interesting. I don't remember exactly what happened, but you can look up the episode if you want to see it. Okay. All right. I thought it was, yeah, I was like, dang, like, they they probably could have gone, like, really into deep, like, and we maybe even don't realize it, like, you got to be a PhD math mathematician to really appreciate some of the things they probably put in there. They have a lot of Easter eggs that are all math. That's like, awesome. Anytime they have any math on the show, it is legitimate. People don't realize that a lot of the time, but it's like actual math. Not well, like well, there's a reason to get a PhD <laughs> math degree, just to understand just the better Simpsons. understand The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I just really wanted to understand what The Simpsons was all about. Yeah, there you go. It's awesome. Oh, that's cool stuff. What other, I, I remember, um, I think, 
the guy who wrote the book Alice in Wonderland. That's what it was. Uh, was a mathematician. There's a funny story about how the book was so popular when it first came out um, that the Queen of England herself, and he, he was from England, <laughs> uh, insisted that he send her his next book as soon as it you know, came out. So he did, and it ended up being a, a high-level math textbook. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So that's just funny. Yeah, imagine her getting that and, uh, yeah, gosh. Is it, does it also have the same subtleties, like in Alice in Wonderland, with, like, the math, math, mathematician would really uh, appreciate? So Alice in Wonderland itself was actually written to demonstrate quantum mechanics, uh, from, and it, it does use mathematical principles to display that. All the characters are supposed to be, like, different particles um, acting in the quantum realm. And that's why the cat, for example, can be in multiple places at once and things of that sort. Um, it was supposed to show how insane quantum mechanics are by showing characters that represent the actual principles of quantum mechanics in a fairy tale wonderland uh, that this little girl goes through. And then the actual book, Alice in wow. Wonderland, is it's not just like the Disney movie, the animated one, the original one uh, is just like the first half of the book. And then the second Disney movie is actually the second half of the book or whatever. Yeah. Uh, which is an interesting thing that people don't seem to realize if you actually read the whole book. They, she actually goes through and kills the Jabberwock and all this crazy stuff. And it was written in 1865. Was it really? Yeah. Yeah. That is wild. I, I didn't know quantum has been around for that long. No. Oh, yeah. Well, math, math is at the forefront of pretty much everything. Right. Um, yeah. m the original people that literally created, like, computer programming were mathematicians. Mm -hmm. yeah. It used to be that to be a computer programmer, you were a mathematician. Yeah. Um, and the first pe people who actually dealt with computers were math. Well, uh, majors uh, the first, like, like, computers were people. Like, people were called computers before well, computers yeah, came I mean, out, right? The, the term... <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. they were the mathematicians that... Yeah. The term computation everything. and computing yeah. just meant to solve math mm -hmm. problems to begin with. Yeah. And that's, that's where... I mean, that's what computer means by definition. And it was just sort of expanded to mean these devices that that's all they do is math. Right. Um, and everything they do is outputs in mathematical terms. Right. So if I became president of the United States, let's say like next day all of a sudden, and I get to pick my advisors, are you telling me that I should probably have a mathematician amongst them? Uh, I... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, no, no. There's no question about that. Yeah. There's okay. a lot of uh, things that have a lot of math that really someone who doesn't understand math should not be doing. Stuff to do with economics, stuff to do with uh, agriculture. Really anything, right? Military stuff to some degree. Uh, What's the off-limits of math? Like, what would you say, like, as a mathematician, they probably wouldn't be able to, like... Uh, that? It's more social stuff. Social when stuff. When it comes okay. to, like, public relations and things like that. Uh, I mean, I may sound very talkative, and yeah, I probably yeah. am, but at the end of the day, I don't want to say I'm the best when it comes to public relations. Yeah. Even if I am on the PR committee, in a sense. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh... <clears throat> And that is probably the only area where mathematicians kind of are relatively weak. But even then, they're such a diverse group, it's, it's not really like most other uh, degree programs and things of that sort, where you find like a certain type of person always does that for the most part, and you can kind of classify those people in general. Mathematicians are stereotypically eccentric and unique in that respect. There's yeah. really no consistency between their behaviors. Some of them will seem like normal people, some of them will seem like complete nut jobs. Uh, I'm somewhere. Where, where do you there. lie? Yeah, <laughs> somewhere in the middle. You said no. <laughs> uh, I'll leave that up to your imagination. Okay. I'm okay. sure anyone can tell after this uh, broadcast we have today. <laughs> so. Yeah. So one of the things also I was thinking about was like as an engineer, um, even in the engineering world, you know, I get the opportunity to to work at Northrop and stuff like that, and see kind of what it looks like to. Uh, kind of see what you like what it looks like real world after you finally get out of college and what I've noticed is that um, and I even hear it from there is you know and the, the degree that I'm getting is is really to learn how to think like an engineer and specifically an aerospace engineer you know obviously there's this great story um, about uh, the F-17 with Skunk Works uh, which is Lockheed Martin's um, I guess their classified division in the sense um, so they actually took the F-17, and there was this guy who originally ran it before um, he was superseded. Um, and 
the individual was able to look. This is old, reti- like old guy who just has been in the work so for so long. He literally just look at a design and be like, "All right, well, your tail fin is off by about three degrees. If you do that, then you're probably going to be a, get about maybe whatever three hundred newtons of lift or something like that." And they're like, "Wait, what? How can you just say that by seeing it? Like, you don't you have done have done the calculations?" And so they, what do they do later? They do the calculations that he said 300, they get 296 or something like that. And they're like, oh my gosh, like how, how can he do that? Um, and so they, they like, that's, that's kind of like almost in my mind, kind of the part, part of engineering is you're looking at something and you're seeing it through the eyes or the lens of, of whatever that major or whatever that, I guess, ideological focus, um, an academic focus that you, you pursue um, so that when you come to those problems, you see it in that way. With that said, um, how would you describe maybe a mathematics perspective or mathematician's perspective? So math is uh, similar in some ways, but very different in others. Uh, so you described a guy who basically was so experienced in his field that he could do everything almost automatically without even trying. Mm-hmm. The thing about math is that's basically impossible. Is the entire point of math uh, when it comes to at least as a degree program and being a mathematician, is to solve problems and new problems every day. Uh, math itself is the embodiment of logic and reasoning by definition. Mm-hmm. All, all you're saying is that this plus this equals this, or if you do this and this, then this will happen, and so on. And you can have very long chains of cause and effects, but that's basically all an equation is, is you're saying this cause leads to this effect. Hmm. And in some cases, they're interchangeable, and that would be inequality and stuff like that. Wow. Um, and then when you have inequalities, you have a range of effects and things of that sort. Anyways, that's all math is, basically. But because of that, every problem's new. You never can get into a point where you can just look at something and be like, I know what this is. I mean, you might have seen it before, and that's different, but it, you're always going to be experiencing new things. Once you solve one problem... You're done with that problem. You go yeah. on to the next. So there's no real reason for you to have to go back and solve the same thing over and over again. Yeah, and I wouldn't say that that, that exact scenario was a, like when the, the drawing that they were presenting was for a kind of remodeling something that already existed. So he kind of understood, I think it's the general, um, like you can look, for example, you look at a uh, any sort of plane, you can figure out what its uh, aspect ratio is and then figure out what the type of speeds. You literally could just look at it and just see the length of the wings compared to the body, and you could say, okay, well, this this is going to go about this speed, depending on if it's a third or a half or, like, based on the, the length of it. Um, so it's more, like, general. When you get to the number side, keep, keep in mind, I don't know how accurate this book is. I'm assuming it is pretty accurate. But um, I think the, the biggest takeaway that I was saying was just, like, kind of the, you know, you look at a water bottle, I look at a water bottle, I say I could throw it and make it fly. <laughs> what does a mathematician say? Like, what would you say? Um, if you could say you could make a water bottle fly by so like if you just looked at something like through a mathematician's eyes like what do you see numbers floating around or like what (laughs) um i i don't see numbers i mean if you look at the water bottle yeah there's numbers on it because there's a lot of (laughs) interesting uh information actually written on the bottle about like the barcode and things like that that people don't normally think about um So, I mean, you, there's multiple ways to look at it, truthfully. You can look at the actual information that's listed on the object, which most modern objects will have some sort of information about where they were built or their, you know, number or whatever like that. Uh, but then additionally, you know, you can look at tri- uh, shapes and different trends and statistics and probabilities. Uh, it depends really what you're looking at. That's a very vague term. It, it's, it's extremely relative is the point. If yeah. I'm looking at a rock, obviously no one made that rock per se, but I can notice that rocks have a general shape to them, particularly depending on what they're made of. Yeah. Um, especially with things like salt and stuff like that, where you know cubic and or diamonds, which have shapes. And anyways, uh, but if I look at stuff that was man-made, like I said, a lot of time I'll have an actual like zero number on it, and I can, you know, mathematically I can show how that number is represented if I know the system that was used to create it. A lot of objects have unique numbers, others have, or are all the same. In the case of the water bottle, I would think they all have the same barcode. Um, but I could be wrong. Uh, Interesting. So I got, a, I got a question for you. Is there any um, kind of like great question you want answered through mathematics? Is there any like goal equation for you? 
Uh, I mean, like any, any there's bounties. I think. Then, there's uh, there's the theory of there being like the super equation in physics that like represents literally everything. The theory of everything, right? Uh, <laughs> it's it's, but I mean, theoretically, if you could quantify everything in the physical world into some sort of variable and have only the independent variables, you could make some equation like that. It'd probably be really convoluted, but I wouldn't know for certain until I saw something like it. Um, but there's not really like a, a goal or anything that mathematicians are trying to achieve in that sense. Mm -hmm. Um, in general, we're just trying to solve problems and show why things are this way and how we can represent it mathematically. Most math is not actually exact, mm -hmm. um, because the real world has so many variables that you can't account for that you just have to generalize it as much as possible right. and ignore the uh, s small inconsistencies uh, and that's where probability and statistics and stuff like that comes in where you can represent something that's not exact at all mm -hmm. using exact mathematics and it's really interesting um, this is how probability and stats work I mean you have a normal distribution for example and you can have this much of a chance of having any particular outcome uh, and it's not exact because you don't know what the outcome is going to mm -hmm. be until you get it. But at the end of the day, uh, you can show mathematically what it's most likely going to be, and you can use that to, to, to your advantage to actually make practical decisions. Uh, and it's really interesting, actually. Right. Yeah, we, I was. We were talking about uh, categories and philosophy recently, and um, basically how like all models are, are basically non non exact. That uh, you know, no man is exact. No, um, no ideology is exact. Say like you're you're living in a democracy. It's not a perfect democracy. A republic, not a perfect republic. Yada yada yada. Like there's there's never any true, like that that's that's the fight is to think is is there an ideal, or is like is there an ideal geometry? You know, because it's something that we create. But it's uh, that's funny actually. Yeah. What are what are your thoughts on that? Uh, about the geometry particularly, um, I actually was seeing some videos about Euclidean geometry and Euclid's uh, fifth principle or whatever it's called. Uh, fifth. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fifth principle. Yeah. Uh, to, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, okay. Saying. Anyways, no, it's I'm basically saying. because he couldn't prove it using the other four more simple uh, basis uh, assumptions, he had to make a fifth assumption where two parallel lines that went on for infinity, basically, would never intersect um, at either end. Uh, and he actually had to make this as a base assumption. Now, for math, this is actually one of the most hated things about Euclid's uh, book. <laughs> uh, the, what is the name of that book? Uh, it's not geometry. It's the basis for geometry. It's the, the elements. That's the name of it. Okay. Uh, and uh, the other four principles, I can't remember off the top of my head, are very... To produce Simple. a finite straight line continuously in a straight line to describe a circle with any center and distance. Yeah, it's really convoluted the way it sounds, and it, it so sounds like it should be something that you improve. That all the right angle. angles are equal to one another. Yeah. Yeah, all sorts of so, stuff. So what was the but fifth basically the parallel lines. Is that something to do with gravity? Is that a... Oh, no, no. no. Anyways, the point okay. is, is <laughs> what Euclid stumbled on there without realizing it was the premise for hypergeometric space which uh, later became relevant in, uh, in the future. And what hypergeometric space is basically is you can think of if your space was shaped, uh, you know, not s straight, but as like a sphere or something, uh, and you had a 2D plane that was over a sphere, uh, then straight lines would actually intersect eventually going across the sphere because right. relative to the space they're in, they're straight. Hmm. But wow. because they're moving across the sphere, they will eventually intersect. And that's hypergeometric space, is it's not perfectly rigid and straight. And uh, ironically, uh, the space that Euclid describes in his book is not actually what space is like for us. Our space is actually hypergeometric because of gravity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it does tie into that sort of, but that's not, wasn't what I was saying. Um, because the way that planets and any mass distorts space, it makes the space that we live in hypergeometric. Uh, which means it is not perfectly straight, rigid space. And that's how they proved uh, Einstein's uh, 
theory of relativity or something, one of his theories, I don't remember which one it was, uh, because what they did is they looked at the sun during an eclipse and saw if light from stars behind it bent around the sun, uh, even though it would have been directly behind the sun from our position, meaning mm -hmm. we shouldn't be able to see it. I've seen uh, pictures of that. And That's they were cool. able to show that because the light from the stars bent around the sun and you were able to see it, that it meant that the space was curved, and that even though the light was heading in a straight line relative to space, uh, it, the space it was in was curved, and that meant that the gravity from the sun was distorting the space around it. Uh. Christian, my epidermis is contracting. Yeah. It means he has goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That Sorry, is, that sounds weird. That is really cool. <laughs> um, so, wow. Okay. Uh, all right. The, the first thing I, I was thinking about is um, how, would, how would you describe light to me? Like as particles, as waves, as would uh, you? you got to ask me these stupid questions. I, I'm, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. That's sorry. such a simple question. <laughs> on, no, it's not, it's not simple. That's the problem. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, that was actually a very big. Uh, is that still like, in debate thing? right now? It's not. No, it's not in debate. It's okay. been decided that light is both a particle and a wave. And it depends on if it's being observed or not as to how it behaves. Hmm. Um, ah. <clears throat> because basically, it is a wave of probability distributions up until the point at which it is observed where it becomes a definite uh, answer or a definite outcome. So when you're not observing light, it is a wave, and it'll behave like a wave of probability, and it'll be in all the places at the same time. But as soon as you observe it, it'll randomly choose uh, based on the probability a point where it's potentially able to be, um, and it'll become a definite particle, basically. Okay. Is, from our is, is this model used? Is this model used to help us describe it on a more micro level, or is this something that is like like a finite law? Because the, the way I'm understanding it is like it just it moves too fast for us to describe it as a particle at all these points. It's not that it moves too fast. No. It's that it's so small. And it's undefined that until we know where it is, th this is the basis for a lot of quantum mechanics, is that everything is a, just a range of probabilities. You don't actually know where something is until you observe it, at right. which point you know where it is. Hmm. Um, so that the same thing goes for with the electron shell around atoms, is you know that there is an electron around the atom, and you know it has a probability to be within certain positions and everything right. but until you actually look and see where it is you don't know where it is and that's actually expressed in more than just the sense that we don't know where it is it's actually literally everywhere within that up until the point that we observe it for all intents and purposes because of the way it behaves and that was what the double slit experiment with light uh, showed and displayed is that when we didn't observe the light uh, it, inter it interacted as a wave with the um, sheet behind it that was photosensitive. photosensitive. Uh, but as soon as we attempted to observe the actual position, position of the photons, uh, it became definite where the position was, and it meant that the outcome of where it came on the sheet was always definite position, and it was not a wave of probabilities. Um, but if you did multiple photons over a large period of time, because of the way the probabilities worked, even though they reached single photons, it would still form the same pattern as a single photon did as a wave of probabilities, because that was the region it was most likely to be in, and that's why it showed up that way to begin with. Uh, now, the thing that confused me about this is that the actual photosens photosensitive material behind it was technically detecting its position, so I don't know how it reacted to it as a wave and not as a particle to begin with. Um, but I guess that's something that someone who has more understanding of quantum mechanics could tell you. Um, does like math mathematics and quantum mechanics kind of go hand in hand? Uh, yeah, math and everything goes hand in hand. Okay, okay, okay. Quantum Except mechanics social, yeah. are basically the only way we understand quantum mechanics is math. Okay. And in an ironic twist, uh, so when you integrate something, you always have, you know, whatever you integrated plus some constant, uh, some arbitrary constant, and that's sort of where quantum mechanics come comes in mathematically is you basically integrate or derive and you lose and gain information uh, and you basically have these unknowns mathematically which display themselves in the real world as these uh, weird behaviors in the quantum mechanic level. When we first did it mathematically uh, and they first tried to describe these things they didn't realize that was the case 
They just thought that we couldn't know that information from a mathematical perspective. But what it actually is, is it's so literal mathematically that that information does not exist until you measure it. Um, so if you've ever taken Calc 1 or 2, they give you initial conditions so you can find the constants and things of that sort. Um, and that's basically what you're doing when you measure the actual position of a particle is finding those initial positions uh, so that you can find out. Otherwise, you just have some arbitrary variable that you don't actually know what it is uh, or constant or whatever. Christian, do you have a follow-up? Because okay. I have something that is, could be a follow-up. Oh, you go for it. Okay, so... If the moon exp or sorry, if the the sun oh my gosh. turned into a black hole, <laughs> okay, and it's no, on a please. Saturday night, okay, and I'm outside in my lawn, um, the light wouldn't have reached me yet because it takes seven and a half minutes to reach me. What light? The light from the st oh wait, not, I wouldn't say black hole. Let's say all of a sudden, because <laughs> if it was black hole, the, the light wouldn't actually. Yeah. It um, would. Yeah, it would. It wouldn't even. It would just immediately. Yeah. Not existing. Yeah, we'd all die. Anyways, or whatever. Um, so let's say the sun all of a sudden, a big disc was covering the sun, so we couldn't see the sun. Or how about this? I the moon. When an eclipse is happening. Eight minutes. In reality, the eclipse, moon, the eclipse occurs seven minutes really? before, at, at relative to, I guess, the moon. The eclipse occurs, it's already in front of it, seven minutes before we see it in front of it completely, right? Okay. Right? I just want to make sure I'm correct on that in the sense that... Wait, as are you talking about the moon eclipsing the sun? So, like, yeah. And, I'm, and so, like, let's say the moon's eclipsing the sun. The light that, that's reaching the uh, the moon, it's going to be eclipsing before we see it eclipsing because the yeah. light's still traveling Yeah, there's going to be a very small period of time where the light's being blocked before we actually realize it and kind of... Cause the light, right, because the light's still traveling. Um, so, with that said... Um, are we technically, with our eyes, seeing past events occurring? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you look out in the space, you're seeing stuff that happened millions or even billions of years ago. The stars you're seeing when you look out into space um, may not exist anymore, or at least not in the form that you're observing. Okay. Um, and that's more easily to understand because the time scales are so large. Right. Um, but yeah, technically, when I'm just looking at you right now, what I'm seeing is like a small fraction of a second of what you were like before what you actually are right now. This, right. So, so if yeah. so, explain to me. So, how do this is another simple question. Um, how do telescopes work? Uh, do they do they magnify light like particles or do there's they, multiple. Uh, different types of telescopes. Let's say an infrared telescope or... No, that's not what I meant. Um, maybe not infrared, but like... There's there's light refracting telescopes. Oh, okay. And there's ma uh, magnification telescopes and uh, there's telescopes that use mirrors and everything. For the most part, uh, what a telescope does is it focuses all of the light or whatever wavelength it's looking at onto a single point roughly or a small region and it observes that um so it'll be fisheye lens telescopes for example though they're not as popular because it's harder to get good resolution um that would be a thing uh so it wouldn't affect like if someone's looking at the moon with through a telescope they wouldn't see any change in light because they would be still be seeing from that the light wouldn't be reaching the telescope until the same time as it hits my eye is that correct uh, yeah, assuming that they're the same exact distance apart. So, like, they're uh, right next to me and, like... Assuming, yeah, then... Uh, well, when the light travels through the lens of the telescope, it could go slower than through the air or just empty space, meaning that it could theoretically, if their face was the exact same distance from the moon or whatever, uh, that it would be a very, very small fraction of a second longer before they see it than you see it. Um... And that's a very common thing where certain uh, liquids and solids and stuff will cause light to travel slightly slower. Um, and this can be used to a much greater degree by supercooling certain types of things. And they actually, I think, like, were able to catch a photon or something weird and, like, almost make it go completely still. It was, re I don't know. Um, I have an uncle who works in a lab like that at Georgia Tech. 
and um, he's like working on suspending particles. And I, I don't completely understand it. <laughs> so if I'm looking in a microscope, let's say it's a little piece of bacteria. Relative to the bacteria, is it moving? Like, is there a speed difference in the sense that from the bacteria to how I can see the bacteria moving? Like in the sense, like if it's moving across at a certain speed per second. So the speed that you're observing is the same speed it was moving at when it moved. A quarter but, relative to it. But of course there is a delay between what you're seeing and what it's actually doing. Okay. Um, but that would be extremely minuscule and almost irrelevant, really. So if I was, if I didn't have a microscope, and I feel like I'm kind of like losing track of the conversation. Um, but I really, really feel like I really understand this. So like, let's say there's a piece of bacteria right here, and it's traveling from here to there. You know, like let's say it's traveling for a foot. Just a piece. Just one single bacteria. Okay. Would it be traveling like faster? Than I would observe on a micro under a microscope, uh, or no, slower. no, like, it just at a different time than you're observing it. It is moving. Does that make sense? So you're observing a delay in its movements. It would be here, for example, and you see it back here as it's moving that way. We'll so is the delay magnified? Its actual velocity to your um, to your perceived velocity are equivalent to each other, but the time in which the velocities were taking place. Slightly different. So is Ant Man really running as fast as as it looks like in the movies? Is really the okay. Question. So the thing about Ant Man, if oh you God. want to talk about the physics of that, movie, <laughs> no, never mind. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> is he would have to be running like a hundred times faster relative to his size than the average person, uh, or because you always see those yeah. movies where like technically, you know, if he's moving the same speed as a normal person. The thing is that you look at the distance between his stride uh, and is that's the real problem. That means his feet have to be moving really fast for him to be going to right, same speed right. as him running yeah. full size. That's like uh, if you were to put, excuse me, if you were to put like um, scooter wheels onto your car, imagine how many more times the belt would have to turn. To yeah. Those scooter wheels to well, make I was sure just like thinking because quickly. When I was younger, I always like imagine what would be like if we had giants like walking around. Would they be like oh, and, like walking really <laughs> slow, or would it like you know? But relative to them, they're just walking normally, you know? Because you always see that in like movies like Jack the Beanstalk or whatever, you know. Well, there is a an Englishman. a physical maximum to the speed that your muscles can contract. Uh, so if there was a giant person, assuming their body was stable, uh, they would probably move slower i mean here's an example uh if you get like a lizard uh a tiny lizard that you can just catch around wherever here in florida uh you can see that they run pretty fast right and if you were to scale them up to be the same size as like a person they'd be running like 80 or 90 miles per hour <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to think about that that sounds scary oh uh, my be gosh. because what it is is their muscles because they're smaller um they have less They're, weight that they need to... No, it's, it's not even that. Okay. Uh, that's, that's not really the problem. Because they still have to give the same relative force to their weight. They just have to... I don't know how to describe it. They, they just move faster because there's a shorter time delay between their brain and the actual muscles itself. Interesting. As well as how uh, the, the physics of their size means that for them to move the same speed as me they just have to move faster i don't know are you telling me that shorter people smaller people are smarter or like are quick think faster than us if their uh, brains are smaller? smaller people theoretically have faster reactions okay i don't know why you'd think they're smarter that well just like, they think faster their like hands are smarter is that why that kid beat me in that math competition in sixth grade the shorter I, kid i don't know well, if you had to write out your problems maybe <laughs> um theoretically if you had smaller neurons you would be small. You'd be smarter, but that's just because you'd have a higher concentration of neurons. So shorter pathways. Yeah, I guess you could. Well, think higher faster. density. I think is what he's higher going density. on. No, it, actually, if you had the same amount of neurons, but they're all smaller, so you just had a smaller brain in general. I think you would be able to think faster than someone with a larger brain with the same number of neurons, but you'd have the same intellectual capacity. Mm. Um, okay. So you'd just be able to come up with decisions and stuff faster. You wouldn't actually be any smarter. Right, okay. But, of course, being able to react and think faster might be beneficial in its own way. So is that what we're doing with computers nowadays, is trying to shorten those processes and, like, the actual... 
like what? to make a computer faster. The reason, the, no, the reason we put, we try to make a, what are they called, transistor smaller, is uh, because so we can just have more in the same amount of space. So it's more, it, not like it's because you want more computational capacity. It's gotcha. not really about speed. Technically, it makes it faster because, like, like I said, there's a shorter distance, um, and it should be proportionate to the size, for that matter. Um, so a, a computer with the same computational power that's half the size should be twice as fast, roughly. I mean, that's that's a guesstimate. That's probably not true. There are certain processes that can't actually be reduced in speed no matter how you do it. we got a pen and paper. Prove it to me. Math. I don't know. Math I'm, I'm not a... I'm, not a <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't use computers like that. I don't design hardware. I just use software, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I code neural nets and stuff from scratch. I can do all that, but I... You want me to actually like make the hardware? You're crazy. Yeah, yeah. Now you're good. What is the most astounding fact? Oh no. Just in general, the most blow, astounding can you, fact. Can you just blow our minds? Actually, the most you, astounding fact. I like the spear thing. Wait, what? Just astounding fact and blow our minds. Just to, to our generic level. facts. So make make sure we can understand it though, because what is the most astounding fact? Astounding. Uh, I, I don't know. The most astounding fact, uh, to me, as a as consi- in mathemati- mathematical world, you're you're speaking. Of? I'm giving him free reign. Man. Uh, free most, reign. All right. The most astounding fact is that, uh, you have to be biased to make a a decision like that. Uh, there you go. I like that. You have to be biased to make the, to be able to decide exactly what you're. Sta- okay. Well, can you instead blow our minds with something that maybe didn't blow your mind, but was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But like for us, it'd be like, oh my gosh. Well, if it didn't blow my mind, I don't know how it's gonna blow yours. Well, I maybe mean- you're just gotten numb to like the mind blowing. You know, <laughs> you just been mind blown so many times. <laughs> um. I don't know. I can just spit some random stuff out at you. Right. Right. Give me, give me uh, one thing yet. I'm, I'm just curious. If maybe that could be the uh, next. So, so here, let's just see how many people know what this is. A Taylor expansion of f of x is equal to the sum from one to or from zero to infinity of f derived n times, uh, where n is the summation point that you're at. Uh, times x minus a all to the n power all over n factorial. Uh, if you understood what that means, then you, I think you're pretty qualified mathematically. If, if you didn't, then you don't have the right to call yourself a mathematician. I didn't say belittle us. I was saying... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, like, the whole... Like, the, 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 what I really... I never realized that, like, you know, in a spirit... Assuming, uh, as you said, like, a spherical... Uh, I guess plane in the sense those two lines would meet would you say that if time were to be represented would it be a time like in, in, inflection or like I don't know if that's the right wording but like because you know in some movies I'm just going to say point to movies again but like you know the Terminator okay mm-hmm. they come in through a spear oh boy. so clearly it's like it's a fact that time there, there could be time distortions that were represented in sort of like a f- spear. Like if we saw the, all of a sudden the time in front of us distorted in some way, maybe visually we could see it as like well, some spear. See, presence. the thing is about the way the Terminator does it is theoretically you shouldn't see a sphere. Um, because what that's basically uh, proposing is happening is that they're creating a wormhole from the point in space and time that they're at to another point in space and time. Uh, the thing is, is it should be virtually instantaneous, and there should be almost no time that it exists. It should exist for an exact instant in time, so there should just be a release of energy, uh, and then instantly the person's there. So this actually is kind of funny. Um, this goes back to con- some, some uh, conspiratorial stuff about the Philadelphia experiment <coughs> that right. I thought about personally. Uh, and... Uh, Anyways, so what the Philadelphia experiment was, they claim the goal of the experiment was to make a boat invisible during World War II or something. Um, and what ended up happening, supposedly, is the, the boat, like, disappeared in a big explosion, reappeared in, like, Virginia for, like, a few minutes, and then 
reappeared back where it was with like people fused into the metal and stuff like that. <clears throat> Anyways. What? So my personal belief with this, from a more scientific perspective, is, uh, and a lot of people think that they lied about what they were attempting to do, or that something just went horribly wrong or whatever. I mean, obviously something went horribly wrong, but it's not the point. Assuming it happened for real, of course. Uh, what I personally believe is that if you tie it in with um, Stephen Hawking's theory about black body radiation. Uh, <coughs> What's that? <clears throat> or it's not black body radiation. It's, uh, it's Hawking radiation. Basically, at his theory is that in the very smallest levels of space, there's particles being constantly created and destroyed because of background energy. And at a event horizon, like a black hole, <clears throat> the particles, one could end up going into the black hole and the other could go the other way, and it could generate basically energy from the black hole itself. It could actually emit radiation, and I think this has actually been proven. I don't know how, but um, anyways, and the idea is that because, and this is to, for conservation of mass and energy, um, <clears throat> because originally it was thought that the all the mass and all the energy that went into black hole was just lost and separated from the rest of the universe. But this could be a way to conserve it because it would theoretically over time emit the same amount of energy that has been consumed by the black hole and then would be in essence pushed out of our space time altogether and just decay. And that's and this is all a bunch of stuff in physics. <coughs> Anyways, the theory is that when they tried to make the ship invisible, they created an electromagnetic event horizon so that electromagnetic particles did it reacted more or less the same way they would have for a black hole um and that caused the ship to basically move out of our space time temporarily uh and emit an amount of energy equal to the energy contained within the ship and the entire perimeter of the actual uh area around it that it was trying to cloak uh, and then, as soon as it reappeared in a different dimension or whatever, then it moved to, or it, it moved through a different dimension of space, like the f a fifth dimension or something. Uh, kind of like a back door. It would still be, no, I mean, it's like, based on string theory, we are in 11 dimensions. Just another space. place, bro. <laughs> just, okay, okay, just something okay. we can't see. <laughs> okay. So it's just another direction that we cannot physically travel, but it theoretically exists. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Anyways, so they were able to move that way or something, uh, and then they moved back to a different point in our physical space, or something of that sort. I don't know exactly what happened. Basically, the idea is that they, the the, radi the Hawking radiation created by this barrier caused them to actually move out of our own space time, and then when they went to a different space time, they still had the stuff active, and it caused them to move again. I think I did the calculations. And it would have taken like 0.02 seconds for enough radiation to be emitted to account for the entire mass of the ship or something. Because for a regular black hole, it has like millions and billions of tons of mass. But for a ship that's like two or three tons, it's, like, uh, it's, it's going to take it like less than a second. Yeah. For a regular black hole, it takes hundreds of thousands or millions of years or whatever. Um, and it also has a very large surface area. And that's and the amount of energy emitted is proportionate to the surface area as well, uh, which is another reason why it would have done it much faster than a regular black hole. Um, so, anyways, uh, the idea is that their experiment did work, and it was what they claimed it was going to what they were trying to do. They just didn't realize at the time this would be a side effect of it. And they and instead of cloaking the ship and bending the light around it, they actually separated it electromagnetically from the rest of the space around it and created an electromagnetic event horizon, which caused it to move out of our space uh, <clears throat> temporarily and then remerge back in uh, when it did basically the same thing in a different dimension or whatever, uh, <clears throat> because it was still active. So it probably moved across a very large amount of space in that dimension or whatever. Uh, before it came back. Uh, and that's why it probably ended up in Virginia temporarily or something. There could have actually been from a parallel timeline or whatever. And not the same one that we saw. So, or we had. Anyway, so there's some conspiracy theories for you with science to explain more in depth what could have happened. Isn't it funny now, like, 
like our guards kind of go up as humans when we hear conspiracy theories. And I mean, like for some reason there's merit, yes, but there's also been conspiracy theories that have like turned to be true. And not just like whack ones, but you know, just theories of how our universe exists. Yeah, why is that so bad nowadays? Why is it so bad to have a theory about something that's it's it's so strange? Great. It's like we it's label like it. we think we understand everything, and then and then when somebody comes up with something, that's like no, that's that's crazy. That's nonsense. That that's that that's hubu, just a conspiracy that's that hubu theory. Juju. The hubu juju. <laughs> You know yeah. exactly, and That's it's exactly like we we're like kind of scared to philosophize in modern day. Well, it's like with um, the conspiracy theories, quote unquote, of anti-vaxxing parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know everyone hates those people a lot, and I do support you know getting vaccinated for your kids and everything. But it's not completely far fetched to actually think that uh, vaccines could cause some sort of mental abnormalities, particularly if they're given to extremely young children, because the way a virus works. Uh, is it implants DNA into your cells that cause you your cells to reproduce viruses? But the DNA could also cause other things to happen, and often does. And mm-hmm. there are cases where viruses have not actually caused other viruses to reproduce, but just weird effects and mutations. And we actually use viruses for gene editing now uh, yep. in early yes. stage uh, tests, and that's how we do it. Um, so it's not far fetched to think that a virus could have the gene that causes autism in it. And if given to a child at an early enough age, could cause their brain, when it fully develops, to actually have autistic uh, properties. Which um, it could be intentional or not. I mean, like, that's, I think that's it, where I it really gets conspiracy. I don't think it would be intentional. Yeah. Um, but it's not impossible I wouldn't to imagine, yeah. Now, most of these, some of these viruses, depending on the vaccine, don't have any DNA in them at all. And right. they can't cause that, so they're inert. But a lot of them just have weakened DNA, or, and some of them are even like the full-fledged virus, right. uh, depending on the, the vaccine. Um so I can't say for every single vaccine what the case is. There's right, obviously right. somewhere that's not going to be the case. But the capability is there. It's yeah. not like, yeah, that's not. A, and the reason I mentioned the intention thing, because I think that's where it kind of like becomes like a, you know, one of them, your kid's not getting the, 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 the vaccine he needs to, to really uh, be very healthy. I even read a story about um, there was this kid who turned 18, got every vaccine he needed, mm-hmm. um, and then he ended up getting sick. <laughs> Yeah, you can actually get sick from certain yeah. vaccines. It's yeah. very common, actually. But like you got them all like at the same time. <laughs> well, everything you do is a gamble. Oh, everything yeah. at the same. That seems like yeah. Let's talk about pro- probability. Wonder. They're not allowed to do that. Yeah, tell, tell, talk, talk to me about probability. Okay. Well, I just, I just want to relate back to the earlier we mentioned that okay. there's like nothing that is truly perfect. There's like the I- ideals are that they're ideals. They're they're models that we've kind of generated in our heads, and maybe there is some sort of you know, dimension that, like, truth exists in. <laughs> but, I mean, that's that's a little far-fetched for us to have any under, understanding on right now besides, like, I guess logic and then trying our best to understand some of the uh, irrational things that we know about ourselves, like that we exist, we are conscious, we have emotions. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's like two that. different types of truth. Yeah. One would be more ab- adequately explained as fact or objective truth, which is things you can uh, observe. Now, I realize that people say, oh, but what if this is all imaginary or whatever? And yes, that's theoretically possible, I suppose. But at a certain point, you just have to say, well, this is what I see. This is what's happening. Yeah. Whether or not it's real or not, I can't say definitively, but I'm just going to assume it is. Um, or even if it isn't, it's still something I'm observing and seeing, so I can still comment on it in an objective sense. This is um, what us <laughs> philosophers would call like physics or knowledge, you know. Yeah. Um, the thing is, is then there's biased truth. The thing is, for anybody to actually make a decision of any kind, you have to have an inherent bias. Mm-hmm. Um, you can look at all the objective truths there are, all the facts and everything, but unless you have something you're trying to uh, do, if, unless you have an intent or a goal, there's no reason for you to or not to do anything. Um, if I'm not trying to do anything, if I'm just completely indifferent, uh, there's no more reason for me to sit here and do absolutely nothing than there is for me to get up and go run a mile, um, because I have no goal in the end, no, nothing I'm trying to achieve. And a lot of people don't realize that they inherently are born trying to achieve something. Most people, it's just the biological, um, they're trying to achieve happiness, whether they realize it or not. A lot of people uh, say it explicitly i want to be happy blah 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 Mm -hmm. um and i would not advise this personally because it's it's not really 
based on anything and you're having competition with a lot of other people that are trying to achieve the same thing as you. Right. So obviously it's going to be... You're more of a goal-oriented yeah. kind of guy, right? Uh, <clears throat> but if you have like true goals in life, like you want to survive, you want to reproduce, you want to be generally successful, something like that, nothing specific, then... I'm not saying you're going to attain happiness out of it. You may or may not. That's not the point. The point mm -hmm. is happiness is not your goal, so it doesn't matter. Uh, your goal is to do these other things. Uh, and if you're trying to do that, then it's much more clear and much more explicit. And and that's where a lot of people, they get confused about things, um, is they have completely different inherent goals, but they're assuming that the other people they're talking to have the same goal as themselves. So when someone says, I'm trying to do this, uh, and they say, but that would go completely against being happy or whatever. You've got to realize that person's not trying to be happy. They're trying to do something else. Right. Uh, <clears throat> and a lot of people just don't understand that at all. Uh, so do you, I guess, do you find happiness in math? Or just like more of a sense of uh, like achievement? Uh, I, I told you before, I chose math because I wanted to... Make money? Just make money and have a more basically my goal in the short term uh or i shouldn't say short term in about 10 years or whatever is to be able to live entirely off of an investment structure that i can create uh by first okay, getting a decent job p potentially uh and co collecting that money that i get from that job uh and then to invest that money into things like real estate stocks cryptocurrencies um, bonds, etc., whatever is relevant at the time, uh, and to basically make enough money through my investments, not only to support myself, but to have extra, and then have an exponential rate of growth after that. Um, it may sound complicated, but it really isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. Real estate, for example, um, in this area, an average house is about one hundred fifty to $200,000. Uh, and I'm actually a licensed realtor. I don't know if... Yeah, if anyone needs to sell a house, just uh, hit Paul. No, 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 do not do that. <laughs> but, um, he'll, he'll math it up. Uh, anyways, and a house of that type in this area, again, uh, the house I'm at right now rents for about $1,500 a month, between fourteen and 1700 actually, but we were renting it for $1,500. Um, and if you consider that's an $18,000 per year uh, uh, revenue stream uh, on a house that is worth about $200,000, and we actually got for about one hundred and eighty grand or something like that <clears throat> after taxes and everything. And uh, so that, that's nearly a 10% return in revenue uh, yearly. Now, after taxes and insurance and maintenance and upkeep and stuff like that, uh, you're down to about eleven or twelve grand per year in your pocket. Um, off of a about two hundred thousand dollar per year investment, we'll say, uh, as the market is kind of inflated right now. Um, mm -hmm. and I do have to say that this is my personal opinion, because I can actually be legally bound for saying these things because I'm a licensed realtor. Uh, so take this with a grain of salt. I advise you do your own research if you don't believe me, uh, and don't take everything I say for, for, for truth. I'm sorry, I have to say this legally, but um, is that kind of guy? What's that? He's our kind of guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so while you guys are talking about that, I was thinking about something that I was hoping we could kind of finish off the night with a topic. It sounds, it looks like we're going a little later than expected, but I don't think that's uh, too bad considering the, the company that we have. Um, so you guys ever heard of mind-body dualism? Yes. And then um, maybe. Okay. So the concept is that um, our mind are, are not, is not our body. Or our mind is not our brain, and our brain is not our mind. In the sense that um, it's almost as if like our minds or our consciousness um, exists in a different reality and almost controls our bodies and our and our minds through um, some sort of force or. It sounds um, like the concept of a soul, basically. Almost slight like that, um, but almost it's, it's it was originally who I'm pronounced. See, you're, the reason you're here, Christian, is because I can't pronounce these philosophers' names really well. It's like Descartes, but Descartes. It's not the, Descartes is uh, actually a mathematician as well. Okay. Gotcha, yeah, a gotcha. lot of a lot of famous philosophers. philosophers were mathematicians. Yeah. yeah. Pythagoras so, was a philosopher. Mm -hmm. So was Newton and some other people. 
So with the um, with that, so like I want to just throw a little more uh, another preface in that. So it even goes farther to talk about, and I was kind of doing a more a little more reading. Um, even like phen- phenomenalism, uh, or also called subjective phenomenalism. Id- phenomenalism. There you go. Thank you, the Christian. You um, can't pronounce any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. I'm so so phenomenon. It's yeah, like yeah. You're j- you're just understanding what kind of goes on. Right. So it's you. based on perception. It's also called subjective idolism. Um, and so basically it's the physical objects and events, um, all physical objects and events are reducible to mental objects, properties, um, events, ultimately only mental objects, for example, the mind truly exist. Uh, Bishop Berkeley claimed that if we think of our body as merely the perception of the mind, um, and so, yeah, with that stated, so it, what's interesting is if you, some of the things that might support, uh, uh, an ideology or a thought like this is that there, I, I've seen, they give the example in the article I read um, of stroke victims who can't control half their body. They, all three of them that they've asked, you know, who knows how de- in depth this study was, they claim, and I've heard this before, they have a ghost arm or they can feel their arm moving 100% as if it was there, even though it's not actually there. Um, and this almost can support the, the concept even of, of dualism, the sense that maybe your mind and, and your body, it, it's kind of like, the physical form that's there it maybe isn't directly um, attached to the, uh, you know, the consciousness that's there. Your consciousness may continue to have an arm, even though your body doesn't, in a sense. Um, and also another one that I've want uh, that I've actually seen that's interesting is I've seen someone who puts a mirror. Um, they do this kind of prank with their friends. They put a mirror in the middle of the table, have a fake arm on one end, and have someone put their other arm on the other end, and so they can see, or maybe like some sort of blocking thing, so they think it's their arm. Because, like, visually, it's like an illusion. It makes it look like your arm. And then all of a sudden, they don't tell you what they're going to do. And they go ahead and grab a hammer and hit the fake arm. Yeah, that was loud. <laughs> and hit the fake arm with a hammer. And the person reacts and feels the pain as if their actual arm was hit. Um, and, I mean, I'm curious to see if, if in some degree, that maybe would support um, that side kind of uh, concept where your mind is interpreting something and perceiving something and therefore experiencing something depending on the perception that you have. Um, and so with all that said, Paul, tell me what you think about that. Uh, I don't think this is really a mathematical question in any way. It's kind of ph- philosophical, uh, but also with the... Uh, uh, I think that a lot of that stuff can be explained very simply in more realistic terms, uh, like things about how nerve endings uh, are just broken and can give false signals, even though... Uh, there's not anything connected to them, and about how uh, your brain may have become so accustomed to certain patterns that when something occurs, uh, it ex- it feels what it expects to feel, even though it doesn't actually happen, and that can explain actually both the thing where you're talking about the hand, uh, uh, the fake hand, as well as um, when someone tries to move their arm and they just don't have an arm. Uh, they feel like it's moving even though it's not. Um, but the actual premise that you have some sort of extra dimensional presence connected to your brain does not actually sound far-fetched to me, but not for some sort of philosophical reason or whatever, but more because I personally believe that it is highly likely that life has evolved some sort of mechanism of that sort without us realizing it hmm. um, yet, and it may or may not be in our DNA or even something else. Uh, that causes it, <coughs> but uh, it's it's very very likely that life has found some sort of little cheat code or whatever like that mm-hmm. that causes more efficiency and some sort of gain of some sort that I can't demonstrate using the physical matter we have hmm. available at this point in time at least. Well, I think the reason I asked you really um, was because of the. Um, I mean, if we look at the philosophers who had proposed such things, they did have uh, a certain, I don't know what degree per se, but, um, or literal degree per se, um, they really had for, uh, in mathematics. It was kind of pre-degrees. Pre-degrees, gotcha. They, okay. they were setting, yeah, they were writing <laughs> the, the, the words. Of, like the sophists and <laughs> stuff. So, so Christian, did you have any comments on that? Or? Um, yeah, well, um, t- when talking about a soul, basically, um, or kind of ditch any connotation you have on that word uh just when talking of the soul uh we tend to think of it in one of two ways you're kind of either 
Think of your brain as like a TV set that's kind of tuning in to this larger frequency of consciousness that you're yeah. being delivered or that you are like the transistor yourself and you're you're sending out you know your own consciousness you're generating it because your body's alive okay and uh those are two big theories when talking about independent uh, living consciousness and there's other theories that talk could talk about like kind of social consciousness um but the biggest mystery that we have because of the soul is consciousness itself it's it's one thing that we understand exists but the driving force itself is absent uh like in like in some theoretical physicists that are just physicists uh, physics problems that are just kind of left open-ended it's it's similar to that and and we don't know you know why we're consciousness and what it means other than uh either you know religious purposes or of evolution standpoints of it just helping us uh you know be alive so mm -hmm. uh, another neat thing to think about uh, another mind experiment is to think about anesthesia okay have you ever been under anesthesia no anesthesia? but i heard that with gingers it takes a little bit more really which is scary I yeah i think we, we have this left R, power do we have like an r and e gene or something like that that makes us redheaded and we absorb vitamin e more efficiently and so you have die to count. faster. No, just kidding. You have to count a little bit longer. Yeah. What about you? Have you been? Uh, yeah, yeah. Put down? I've uh, I had to have my wisdom teeth removed, and I was put under anesthesia for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting a little longer. But I wasn't that. technically uh, like I, I was unconscious, but I was not asleep. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't know. Anesthesia. Do you remember the? Experience? Were you feeling? No. Does this mean that you okay. were feeling things? No, I mean like it wasn't the type of anesthesia that puts you to sleep. So I was. It's uh so. Did it just numb you? No, but you were still no, awake. I, I so was I was unconscious, but I was still awake. So to Christian's point, um, does it would that still apply? Oh, that is weird. So were you still acting, or the doctor saying you were like interacting with them? Yes, the type of anesthesia they gave me, I was still able to move, and it's sort of like uh, rufalin or something like that. You don't remember anything, uh, and you're not conscious during when it's happening, but okay. you uh, aren't asleep either you're, you're moving you're awake um okay i don't know how else to describe it that's, right. that's what it is yeah that's that's so weird so uh so one of the theories that um belongs to you know things of anesthesia and going back to the the tuning in kind of theories is that uh during that time you know you're either like your your frequency like tuner it's kind of like turned off to, to it hmm. or your um your generator is turned off or your just ability to make memories uh, is um, also turned off. And so, so like maybe like the two-way stream in but, a sense gets... But really anesthesia is like not really well understood. It's just like, from my understanding, doctors have understood that this is something that can help to like undergo these, these surgeries and stuff. But we don't know why it works. So reverse engineering something like anesthesia maybe a breakthrough in the future to understand I mean, consciousness there's, there's some pretty basic principles i mean i don't know about the specific types of anesthesia and like that obviously ones that knock you out cold uh help because you're not f aware of what's happening right right uh, I, I these but, are the subconscious level is what he's talking about like but even the uh just like painkillers and stuff obviously help for clear reasons and anesthesia most of the time has similar uh reactions in addition to some extra ones that painkillers have uh, where you're not able to actually feel it or you don't interpret it the same as how it actually is. Right. Um, which obviously would help you deal with it when it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So to that, so, to, so the, the TV point I think was interesting, and I know we're probably wrapping it up pretty soon. Um, I even remembered the, the, the dualism kind of concept being described as like, if you were put in a room as a child with a TV and you never were told about radio waves or anything like that, or FM waves, or any sort of, um, you know, uh, frequencies that can, you know, the, the communication between uh, uh, antenna TV set and the antenna outside um, that's broadcasting. If you just saw that, you'd know everything about how to, how to turn up the volume, to change a channel, to turn it off, but you would never truly know, unless you were told, or unless you went outside and figured out for yourself. There's a lot of people that do that. Um, would, so, like, you'd never know how exactly what it is you'd never know that it's being broadcasted to in a sense 
Um, and that's kind of like with the concept of like, what if we're just an antenna that's receiving a broadcast from something else and our bodies is something that's yeah, you know, well, there's encapsulating that. I think that's an important point in a simple way and a very deep way and that there's levels of understanding the universe that we go through from birth to death and we all reach different levels and we all go down mm-hmm. different routes of different kinds of levels of understanding and that's something that our concentrations do they allow us to just view the universe through a different lens right and um i uh, can i can i share a thought with you uh, that please. i wrote down the other night please do all right so, I have been kind of uh, blown, just more blown away than normal about uh, about life, just about existence. Okay. Okay. And the way we were describing that we kind of inhibit ourselves from philosophizing about things, from thinking about theories... Right? Like, we want to know. We want to know concretely. And for us to think that something might be is very stressful. I think just in a, in a biological sense. Um, so we, we, like, fight truly philosoph- philosophical thought. We fight degrees of awe and marble. We fight ponderings of the trepidatious, trepidatious nature of existence at all. We fight the absurdity of being and transposing our being in any deep form. And when we finally give in, there's like no turning back. And when I say this, like, I kind of hope you don't go down that path with me if you haven't understood it yet. Cause it's, um, sometimes it's like really daunting just to think about what it means to exist at all. Um, yeah. Right. And it's, it's like, I, I almost don't want to talk about it anymore because if somebody hasn't had that realization yet, I kind of don't want them to. You that, want them to have it on their own. Yeah, and even then, like, just don't have it. Just be ignorant about it. Don't don't think about it too much. And <laughs> ignorance is bliss. That's a lot of times uh, what I like to interpret the story of Adam of Eve to actually mean. Hmm. Uh, because basically one way of interpreting it is that they were never kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They simply ate the apple and became smart enough to realize that the place they were in was a complete shithole. Uh the whole time, and they were too ignorant to understand that until they gained the knowledge to realize it. Interesting. Uh, so yeah. in reality, they were never kicked out. They just realized they were never in a garden to begin with, and that's why they could never go back. Maybe the they <laughs> exited the dimensional, transdimensional, da 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 and then they actually were on the real Earth, and then it's really that bad place, and yeah. Uh, Do you have yeah. any music for us? Christian? It's so arbitrary, all of it. It just it seems so arbitrary. Yeah, no, this has been awesome. Yeah, it's a really good show. Thank you so I'm, much for coming on. Yeah, thank All you. Right. And, and for those tuning in a little later, um, later, uh, Paul has joined us, um, or for this broadcast, um, a little bit longer than usual, but definitely worth it. Um, Paul has brought his fantastic mind and his understanding of math- mathematics, which really, in turn, is the understanding of most most basically everything um, to a certain degree. It's just logic and reasoning is all it is. Yeah. It's being able to Concretely. look at something and determine what it means and what causes and effects can come in from it and cause it. Yeah. That's all it is. Whether it be, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, crazy theories or, you know, proving actual uh, theoretical means. What do we talk about? Black holes and stuff like that? Goodness. Yeah. I talked about a lot. That was great. Um, yeah. I, I really enjoyed the Alice in Wonderland. Uh, tidbit about yeah. it being a representation of quantum mechanics. I, I did not know that before. I also didn't know that it was created in nineteen or in eighteen late eighteen hundreds. Yeah, it was really wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. And uh, I, I just I feel like because quantum has kind of gone mainstream now, and maybe that's just because science is going mainstream itself. Oh yeah. I don't know. Do you understand it to be that way? No, definitely. Quantum mechanics has been around since literally the mm-hmm. late eighteen hundreds. Um, which is when the book was written. So, do you think it's because we're willing again to like re-examine our understanding of the dimensions we exist within? Mouthful. Uh, <laughs> I think it's just that as the knowledge of this stuff spreads, more people learn about it, and it becomes more popular and mm-hmm. better understood. The stigma against it has gone away with 
religion becoming less popular in the West, uh, though that's starting to be a problem, ironically, for weird reasons. But um, it's more that people just in general are more open to it, mm -hmm. and more people understand it, and more people are going for educations uh, that potentially lead them to attempt to understand it, at least, and learn about it in general, even if they don't know everything about it. Uh, so... I think the, uh, did you have one last thing to say, Christian? Or was there, because I had a take final takeaway. Oh, uh, I, I was just thinking also with um, things that are, with the instruments that we are given today, they're kind of just more loudly displaying what science and math can do for us, whether True. it be telescopes, satellites, probes, spaceships, anything Elon Musk gets his hands on, <laughs> uh, or, um... Uh, the, 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 the Hadron Collider, you know, things like that. They're just so um, exemplary that uh, we can't really fight that that science exists unless you're a refutist, like a flat earther or something like that. You know, you're a complete skeptic. Well, on that note... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think the biggest takeaway that we can uh, get from this is that uh, if you didn't do too well in geometry or uh, algebra... Uh, Go go look that stuff up again. It's it's really important. It might uh, cure cancer one day, or or uh, save the world. It already is. It already is actually. <laughs> so yeah, Christian, you want to take us out? Uh, I think so. Again, we would like you to please share this with any of your friends, uh, family, acquaintances, anyone you think would enjoy this. All of them. Uh, not any of them. All of them. Please, I, w I would like more than just Jace to like on the YouTube. This, this I week. will comment and like it like I do every single. <laughs> <laughs> so any anyway, anyway uh, I'm Christian. I'm and Jace, and I'm Paul. Hey, Paul, did you know that my fast food alias is Paul? Your what? When I go to fast food restaurants, I call myself Paul. Well, don't use my last name. <laughs> my, my last name is Paul Paulson. Paul or, Paulson. Or no, it's not last name's Paul Paulson. My last name's Paulson. My whole whole name's Paul Paulson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I get my soup at Panera. Just play the music, Christian. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> Paul Paulson. So you guys have a good week. Love you. Good night. <laughs>